In Psalms 121, it says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at, at your right hand, and the sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. This morning, this rings a little truer to me. Courtney's been sick for 10 days, and this morning she's having tests. And it says here that the Lord knows, and he is watching over you always. So I know that she's in his hands this morning. He's a constant. He never leaves us. We can rely on him. He won't let you down no matter what. And who knows, we don't deserve this. But yet he loves us enough that he will be with us. So will you pray with me this morning? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for being with us when, even when we don't deserve it. We know you love us. And we can't ask for anything more. Dear Lord, I pray that you will be with the congregation this morning. I pray that you will be with those that are sick, that those that are facing trials and are hurting, and their families be with them, dear Lord. We pray that you'll be with Ron as he brings us a message. And dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation the best gift we could ever receive if we only re reach out and take it. We pray this in your name. Amen. Now, I may get myself in trouble, but what else is new? I want you to know it's Marilee and Steve's anniversary today, and it's number 50. So it's very, very special. So if you've got a little extra love this morning, love on them. Now let's greet one another.
our blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story of how we overcome. We will understand it.
Exodus, Moses was discovering God's glory. He wrote this book to help highlight the fulfillment of God's promises. And through Moses, the Lord revealed his purposes to Israel. Over time, Moses recognized that he didn't want to make decisions or move anywhere without God's presence. He begged God to show himself. From Exodus 33, 18 and 19, it says, Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Most of us are like Moses. We want to feel God's presence in our chaos our crises, and our casual conversations. We would like to see and experience God's glory, but we are not sure how to pursue it. We can experience glimpses of God's glory all around us, but we have to lift our eyes to notice them and to respond. Have you noticed any moments lately that has displayed God's glory to you? Friends, let's not miss the examples of God's glory right in our midst. Let's call out the glory we see so that others might experience his presence too. Will you pray with me, please? This morning, Lord, whatever we do, please help us to do it for your glory. When we're talking to other people, let it be for your glory. When we are working let it be for your glory. When we're spending time with friends and family, let it be for your glory. In all that we say and do, let us do it for you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Changes what
I believe I would be remiss if I did not speak about our wedding 50 years ago today. I went to bed about midnight to a shirt sleeve weather, woke up about 2.30 when my brother came in to about four inches of snow outside. In the middle of the night after that, early morning, any way you want to look at it, the electricity went off. I don't believe in omens. <laughs> so we decided we're going ahead with our wedding. I think it started at 7.30. We advertised it 7.30 in the morning. We advertised it as a sunrise wedding for our families. God has blessed me richly for 50 years because of this woman. If you know her, you know that she is gracious, she is kind, she is loving, and most importantly, she is good and godly. Those of, of you that know me have wondered, what did she see in him? <laughs> She stood by me all these years, served faithful with me in the ministry, has helped to raise three wonderful young men and their families. I am truly blessed. When we arrived home last Sunday afternoon, after two long days of traveling from South Texas, uh, the first news I got when I got in the door was that my good friend Peggy Thomas had passed away. Um, I'd worked with Peggy's husband for over 30 years. He was a wonderful Christian man and uh, pastor to church in Boone. And Peggy had been struggling with cancer for two years and um, finally passed away. And 
we went to her funeral on Wednesday, and it was a beautiful testimony to her life. And there's one thing that kept going through my mind between that time of the funeral and, and the word that we got was the testament of her life was one of being a true Christian woman in every way, um, just short of her 64th birthday. And um, it made me think about her life and about other two Christian women that I have known, many of them probably in this church, and many other places in my life, and just how encouraged I was by her home going and what a beautiful person she was and how that encouraged me. And I hope that there are people here that continue to encourage me and others in this church by being true Christian witnesses. So I have several announcements here I wanted to pray about. Let's put my first picture up on the slide there as we, I'm going to have a prayer time today. Uh, <clears throat> I wondered how I was going to manage to get through all of this today because there's about 25 minutes of announcements at the end of this sermon. <laughs> it feels that way to me. And uh, there is no children's sermon. That's good because I kind of wanted the kids here today. How's that? What's that a picture of? Kids praying. Kids praying. It's love to listen to kids pray. It's sincere. It's simplistic. And it's honest. This week has been a myriad, it seems to me, like people who have been hospitalized for a few days like Sue, and uh, she might be mad if she hear, heard me say that, but uh, I called Sue um, Parrish yesterday because I wanted to talk to her about something she had shared in, on Easter morning here in church. And she said, why'd you call me? <laughs> Who told you where I was? I said, where are you? <laughs> I I, I, no one called me, so we can't be mad at anybody, but bless her heart, um, we had a wonderful visit, and I, I love visiting with Sue, and, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a sermon, but um, Jim Bell has been hospitalized short time this week. I have had uh, two conversations with Tammy about uh, uh, Courtney and 
Connor. Because we're supposed to be recognizing the, them, Connor, today. And they're all uh, r- wrestling with some sort of a viral infection. And they not even know what it is, as far as I know. And then we have... Uh, uh, Our, our, our dear friend in hospice, who is, continues to linger on, Connie, and we want to pray for that family. It's a, it, it becomes a very long uh, time when someone has been ill and they're not really able to communicate. So let's pray for all of these needs and, and many others that uh, don't even know about. And plenty, plenty of that here in our congregation. So let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we, we come to you in times of joy, in times of uh, sorrow, in times of uh, loss, in times of sickness, and we don't have answers. We know there's people waiting for test results right now. And even that can become anguish as we wait and wait and wait. Lord, we need a a sense of faith that is strong within each of us, and our trust level needs to be high. Thinking of what we went to bed listening to last night was the prospect of a war. It's a very serious time. So let us, Lord, remember to pray always in the Spirit. We ask your blessing and your understanding and healing. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I'm going to continue with the series that Anthony has started in the book of Ephesians, and my topic is pretty short. I wanted this picture up here to begin with today because we're going to end with another picture at the end of this message, and I I would like for us to pause and be able to absorb what we're listening to. It's a three-minute video. It's downloaded. We're here today to talk about the seeking of truth, and in Ephesians 6, verse 14... I like to read verse 13 to begin with. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Those are transitioning on their own. Whoops. I want to back up. There's nothing before that. There. That's the one I want. Yes. I was hoping to find someone that would give us an example of what it means to gird up your loins. And uh, I chickened out. <laughs> in the day and period in which Ephesians 6 was written, the, the common warrior wore a long flowing gown, and that would impede your ability to be in battle. So they would take that gown and and heist it up to their knees, kind of bring it together, run it between their legs and bring it up around their back and tuck it into their belt or their sash tightly because you wanted to be able to be mobile, you know, if you're going to be in battle. So thinking a little bit on what Anthony had started about last week about things for us to look at and think about, I chickened out. So... Uh, 
Nobody wants to see my legs for sure. <laughs> Getting ready for battle is so important in the sense of the spiritual battle that you and I are in. We need to be able to stand together in the, in the face of opposition, seeking truth to find it that is eternal. Now, everybody has some version of truth in many different things in their lives. I'm sure of that. We're really here to putting on the full armor for battle. Battle is kind of the theme here in this whole section because we're talking about the armor. And you and I are involved in a battle that is um, never-ending. As I read through the lists of people that are in need of prayer this morning, you think about it, there are so many different forms of battle. How old is Courtney? How old is she? Twelve. She's in a battle right now physically. It's been going on long enough that it's been uh, very concerning to Tammy and Matt and the rest of the family. Uh, but there are also people in battle that are a lot older than that and going through stuff that we can't really hardly imagine. Um, I actually did a funeral yesterday. And, and the family gathered together to, to think of and, and to uh, lift up the rest of the family. It was a, a wonderful time of family, but it was a time of sorrow and something that all of us will deal with. Um, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Stand firm with the belt of truth. Stand firm. It means standing up and in the midst of and in the face of opposition, illness, whatever it might be. A teacher you don't like. They're probably a bad teacher, of course, if I don't like them. But uh, their biggest problem was trying to teach me anything when I was in school. Because I was fairly resistant to that idea. Why do I need that? You know, that attitude that prevails amongst the young. I tell this story, and it's, it's the truth story. I, I don't know that I would have finished high school if it wasn't for two different principles. One, when I was a junior high, and I had missed two weeks of school of illness, I think I had chicken pox and mumps back to back. And I finally got to go to school, and I was way behind. And I wasn't interested in doing the makeup, and the new young principal who was a wrestler from the Un University of Northern Iowa took me into his office and I said he told me what I needed to do and I said well I'll try kind of like that and he looked at me and says you're not going to try you're going to do it <laughs> and to prove it you're not taking any recess until it's caught up you get to come into my office every recess oh that's great but I survived. And again, in high school, uh, in my senior year, the fall of my senior year in high school, I got to notice that everybody in my class was going to college. I said, yeah, why do I want to do that? My dad thought it was ridiculous anyway. So the principal, in the middle of the hallway, so that everybody got to be a witness to it, let me know why I needed to change my thinking in a very loud way. Honestly, I discovered the last semester of my senior year that had I studied, I could have got good grades. <laughs> Probably falls under the, character, or the attitude of a slow learner. Um, stand firm in the gap on the behalf Ezekiel is an Old Testament prophet, and in chapter 22, verse 30, God was prophesying through him, and he said, I've been searching for someone to stand in the gap for the people. 
And he says, and I haven't found it, and I wish I could because I want that to happen so I will not have to carry through with the punishment they're about to receive. Well, for a while, he didn't find anybody to stand in the gap. And so they were carried off in captivity. I always remember after my father had become a Christian, and that wasn't until well into his adulthood that he had heard a sermon on Ezekiel and where it says, if you're a Christian and you haven't done your part and witness to other people that aren't Christians, their blood is on your head. That bothered him. So he started witnessing to everybody that came to the farm. I'm not sure everybody received it well, but it got to him. And you and I, uh, we think that somebody else can do that. We're supposed to stand firm with the belt of truth. The belt of truth, I put it this way, the belt of truth, I took a picture of a belt here, but it needs to be firmly buckled. You know, this, the soldier that took that robe and flipped it up over the back and tucked it in the sash, they had to secure it so that it was there and not going to impede or to become a problem for them in the midst of battle. So we need to get a hold of truth and hang on to it tightly. Buckle secured so that it wouldn't allow the garment to come loose and allow a failure. We might be well physically, mentally well throughout most of life. And we get to the point where we can become complacent. I don't, I don't understand why people would have problems. Because I've never had any problems. But then how strongly am I secure in my belt of truth when there is a problem that comes along? Am I willing to stand in the gap? for others, or for myself even, and say, Lord, I, I guess I've had it kind of easy. <laughs> Am I strong enough all the way through that I can live it? In my earlier years, I spent a time as an EMT. And it was rather unsettling to me to have someone in the back of the ambulance. And I was the most trained one in our fire department. And I was supposed to sometimes have the answers. And I didn't. In fact, one of those last trips that I ever made was a young man who had been in trouble of his own doing. And it disappeared, and, and when he was found, he fell into a coma, and, and we were transporting him. Back in those days, we transported him all the way to Des Moines. And I remember his mother sitting beside me there in the back of that ambulance, hoping that I will give her some good news. And I really didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> you know, in that regard, I wasn't a medical doctor. I didn't know the full extent of what was going on. I never forgot that because I said, there's got to be more that I can do. I could have said more than I was able to say. I just kind of clammed up. Maybe I've told this story before, and I remember a guy that I knew my entire life, and his son's house was on fire, and we went as a fire department, and we got picked up. Uh, I won't say his name, I guess. I better not. But anyway... He started to collapse. The father did. And so they rolled the ambulance in there. And again, I was the one that put him in the ambulance. And we headed for the hospital. And a real moment of uh, truth came when I, he said, well, how do you think I'm doing? I said, well, you're going to be okay. Just relax. You're going to be fine. And he looked at me and he said, you don't know that. <laughs> Yeah, he survived. But he'd had a heart attack previously, so he, he had more of an understanding than I did. There was a couple of those instances where I realized 
<clears throat> I needed to know more. And I needed to be better equipped so that I could offer a service that I felt uncomfortable doing at that moment. Jesus was speaking through the Apostle Paul here, encouraging us to put on the full armor. What is truth? There's one for you. Anybody ever take a philosophy class? Somebody says, what is truth? Good question. The word truth is aletheia in the Greek. Who determines what truth is? Who do we, how do we find truth? What is truth to me? I may discern and decide what I know what truth is, but then someone comes along and challenges it. Truth here is to be subjectively understood, but it is more than human virtue of sincerity and honesty in the usual sense. It's more than that. Truth transcends, motivates, gives one strength in the face of a battle. I've used this phrase a number of times throughout life recently. Trying to decide in a situation that looks like it's becoming a battle and there's an old Indian saying, is this, is this the hill on which I'll die on? Well, you, you get to the idea that is this it? Is this worth me going to battle for something? Am I so secure in my knowledge of truth? Truth becomes so relevant. Go to a different part of the world and people will, under, their understanding of truth may be different than mine. In the world, to the unbeliever, to the ones lacking in faith. The reason I called Sue Parrish yesterday is because I had, I had remembered what she said. I don't know how many of you remember what she stood up and said. She had found in the King James Version, in, in uh, 1 Peter 1.23, to be born again from the corruptible seed. And she said, I'd never been able to find that before. I found it. It says, born again. Well, I got a little intrigued by that. can run around in my little mind ever since Easter, and started doing a little research. Some of the other translations, after the King James Version, changed that wording. But then I found in the New International Version that we have here, it's, it's brought it back. It's being born anew. She was ecstatic when she found that. Did you remember her? She was excited. And I thought, wow. Wow. Now, between all the books that's written and all the sermons been preached, we've used that word so, those two words so often they became meaningless, I guess, to a lot of people. But it is there. It is very clear in 1 Peter 1.23. We need to be uh, aware of and comfortable with. Real, godly truth. Enlightened understanding and a steadfast character. The knowledge of and belief in the revealed word of God. You think we're not in a war? Spiritual warfare, sure it is. Knowledge of and belief in the revealed Word of God. This gives assurance, stability, and decisiveness to his or her life and action. Not only has wisdom and understanding, but they are living in the truth. Living in the truth. Herein is the strength in the hour of test. And I wanted this, yeah, no matter what. 
The word of God, believed and lived, remains intact. If not fully embraced, we may snap under trial. We take it all in and do we believe it? Do we live it? And do we base our faith on it? If not fully embraced, we may snap under trial. The empty cross and the empty tomb are a symbol of love and eternity for me. Faith in Jesus Christ fully embraced brings more than just a cause. I was thinking about this this morning real early. Belonging to a group or a gang is not enough. In my lifetime, we've lived through Waco, where we watched on live TV a group of people being burned out of their place. And they were so committed they would not leave. Jonestown, Guyana, South America. They were so committed that they were willing to drink the cyanide. And I remember it, thinking, like, why? How could anybody do that? Why could anybody do that and cause it? And why would anybody do that and fulfill it? But they did. Interestingly enough, later stories suggest that some of the people who had helped administer the cyanide drink to everybody couldn't go through with them themselves, so somebody shot them. That's terrible to say. Maybe you shouldn't hear that. But <laughs> they didn't have the strength of faith to go through with it themselves, but the other people were encouraged to do it. Do we follow the true chosen Son of God? We, everyone, have to make decisions and determine who do we listen to, who will we follow. Have we, hand, have we embraced the belt of truth and put it on so tight that we are secure? praises of children and infants is like a wall that stops and silences the enemy out of the praises of children and infants out of your praises boys and girls you get to stop the devil and his evil works okay, thank you for the gift of life thank you for all the people who are here Bless all of them. This bless our pastors and our teachers. Thank you, God, for this moment. We come before you, oh God. I pray for, for all these people who have come here, God. We come God. before you this day. Thanksgiving in our heart. We thank you for our parents. Thank you for giving us parents. God, we pray for our, for our family. You protect them where they are with the blood of Jesus Christ. Guide us here. We protect us with the blood of God. Touch them with their blood, Father. If it did not be our parents, we could not be here, Father. Please give them wisdom and knowledge to, to lead us well in, the, in your way, Lord. Pour la pour la place qu'on est en train de déranger les chrétiens dans nos amis pour la place qu'il y en a des de antichrist dans nos amis. We ask you to lead the people in a good way. Please protect them and guide them to love you and to honor you. Please be with us, protect the King us. Of glory to help many souls come in the church so that they may lead the society to have peace, love and harmony. King of glory, King of glory, I'm coming unto you this day. Lord. Guide the people who are being persecuted in different parts of the world, O Jehovah Father, in Northern Korea, Northern India, Iran, 
Lord, we pray that you may give them courage and strength to overcome the persecution. Father, we pray that you may give them joy in their hearts. Father, and we also pray for those who pe people. Pray, Lord, that you may help Christians to remember them in prayer. And I, I pray, Lord, that you may take control of those who are persecuting them. Help those who persecute others to stop doing that. Help, Lord, those who are suffering. Guide them, protect them. I pray that you may hear my prayer. I thank you, God, for all the people who you have healed from their sickness. I, I thank you for, for all the... Pray joyfully always. Pray joyfully always. Pray joyfully always. Be joyful always. Be thankful in all circumstances. This is what God wants from you in your life, in union with Christ. Amen. 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 Prayers of a child are sincere. I get goosebumps just watching it. When you realize what they had to go home to, where they came from, what they were praying for. And when they have these National Days of Prayer in this particular country, you're talking about thousands of kids, tens of thousands of kids, praying for everybody and everything. The wonder of large groups praying and seeking, seeking based upon the truth of the whole gospel and the witness of those who have lived before in faith, in living faith, with witness found in a pure heart. When children pray, generally speaking, they're praying with a pure heart. Don't have all the burdens of life to deal with that Adults might have. So the belt of truth needs to be secure. And it gives us an inner strength to face any and everything that may come along. That's step one, Ephesians 6. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for the attentiveness of our message. May it be from the Lord. And where my words get in the way, let them be forgotten. Jesus, we love you. We pray in your name. Amen. I think we have the choir. And then I have several announcements.
My back on, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> In your bulletin, you have announcements today covering a, a pretty wide range of activities for our church. First one is Lynn and Joan Vandercrawl are uh, willing and able to meet with anybody that has an interest in knowing more about this trip to Atlanta. In, uh, we announced it last week. They are here. They'll be in the back foyer. If you have, want to talk to them about that and get more details, uh, we also have uh, Polly Eye's lunch brunch or bunch next week. Uh, sign up is on the back on the right hand side of the uh, foyer from where I'm standing. They also have the camp work day on April 27th. I see, according to Facebook, they're already working on re roofing some of the cabins and putting steel on them. And also, just for fun, we're having a nominating committee meeting today after uh, we can get upstairs to the um, room right across the hall from the library. Okay, That's the nominating committee for new officers for the coming year, um, which take effect July 1. I wanted to mention that um, I'm speaking myself personally. Uh, since Marsha Brewer had her stroke on Ju Ju uh, January 5th, uh, many, many people have uh, assisted in the travel for Michael and, and Misty to go back and forth to work. And along the way, we have uh, encouraged and to get Misty through a driver's education course. And I wanted you to know that she has received her license. She has her own vehicle and is able to now be driving back and forth. There still may be needs to be some assistance on some sort of a walkway to get Marcia from the house to a car. And that would be in Searsboro, and we'll, we'll talk about more of that later. Then over top of all of that today, we were recognizing new members. And, and we'd like to ask for people to stand as I read your names. And uh, they're going to just be recognized, and then they get to go out first and go to coffee time. Okay? And once they're out there, we'll go through, and we, we encourage you to greet and to meet, shake hands, and we just welcome all of you and all the new membership members. Billy and Diana Young have uh, completed it, and their children, Sam Jacob, Anna, Josiah, and Jeremiah. Thank you. Would you keep standing? Connor was supposed to be in this today, and uh, unfortunately they, they are ill, and so they're not able to be here. Jane Lemke is here today, and she has already gone through and has become an active member. Bob and Cindy Pierce are here today. Gary and Valerie. And, and uh, Larson, also a membership. And then we have Jerry Sorter and Carol Garner are also here. And I would ask that you uh, can depart and go out in there. Thank you for going through all of the everything that was required and monthly meeting approved. And this is actually a, a big deal in the eyes of uh, church. Let's all stand. Lord, we ask for your benediction upon our worship. We ask for your blessing upon all of the work that we're doing in your kingdom as a church. Pray for those committees as we seek new members and willing hearts. We just pray, Lord, that you watch over and bless our entire congregation, whether they're here today or not. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.